Okay, hi everyone. <laughs> Sorry about that brief delay. So uh, my name is Mustafa Mir. I'm a, a new assistant professor at the uh, Perlman School of Medicine at the University of Pennsylvania and the Children's Hospital of uh, Philadelphia. Um, and my lab just started uh, this January. So I'll be talking to you about work that I've done mostly during my uh, postdoc at UC Berkeley today. Um, and uh, what I'll be telling you about is how we can use uh, advanced fluorescence microscopy technologies uh, to uh, including single molecule tracking methods and high dimensional uh, light sheet microscopy to uh, uh, combine with biophysical modeling to understand how transcription is regulated. And so for those of you who are unfamiliar with uh, transcription, so transcription is the first step in gene expression, which is the reading of DNA first to make RNA, and then the RNA gets translated to make protein. And so as you all know, every single cell in our body has the same genome. So the first uh, step in regulating transcription is turning genes on in the right place. So all the different cell types that compose our body can be made. And then at the right time, so that development and all of life can proceed with this beautiful clockwork-like choreography that we can observe. And then of course, at the right level so that we can avoid developmental defects, for example. And so what I'm interested in is how all of this then comes together to make and maintain a living animal. So life is dynamic across a broad range of spatial and temporal scales, which come together to regulate gene expression, starting from single molecule uh, kinetics that occur at nanometer and millisecond time scales, to the organization of our genomic material within nuclei at the scales of minutes and microns, to the patterning of embryos that occur over millimeters, hours, and days. And imaging is a unique technology that allows us to simultaneously access many of these uh, skills. And I apply imaging technologies in the context of uh, embryonic development in this beautiful model organism called Drosophila melanogaster. And for those of you who are not uh, familiar, it's the fastest known developing embryo in the animal kingdom, going from fertilization to differentiated tissue in just around three hours. So this allows us to study these developmental processes in a relatively high throughput manner. Now, the earliest stages of Drosophila development are characterized by these very rapid uh, 40 nuclear cleavage cycle, where the interface time, the time between mitotic events is on the order of five minutes. So during these five minutes, everything you need to do to activate transcription has to happen before the next mitosis kicks in. Now, despite these very rapid nuclear cleavage cycles, the embryo is actually being patterned during these uh, 14 uh, uh, nuclear cleavage cycles. And this process is kicked off by factors provided by the mother, and some of which are distributed in concentration gradients. Now, these concentration gradients uh, interact in a sort of hierarchical network of gene activation and repression to progressively pattern the embryo into more and more defined domains of gene expression which after gastrulation and morphogenesis and a lot of cool biology that I'll skip over in between, go on to form the body segments of the adult animal. Now, a question that has motivated research in this area for many, many decades, going back to Alan Turing, in fact, is how these different concentration gradients are actually interpreted by the genome to achieve this very robust and reproducible patterning that we can observe. Now, in our textbooks, we see pictures that look like this, you know, nice and neat uh, genes turning each other on and off. But the reality is that the nucleus where all of this stuff is actually happening looks much more like this. It's a highly crowded environment where chromatin, and everything necessary for nuclear function is crammed into a small volume and everything is at the mercy of thermodynamics. So here, even the simple question of how a protein like a transcription factor can navigate this complex environment to find and bind its genomic target to turn genes on and off actually happens. And this is especially important given the short interface times that I described during early embryonic development, combined with the fact that gene regulation is often combinatorial. So multiple factors need to come together at the right place at the right time. So this is the question that I was really interested in when I was started on this work is how do transcription factors do this? And I decided to study this in the context of this very classical system in developmental biology, which is a concentration gradient formed by this uh, morphogen transcription factor called bicoid. Uh, 
and it's an anterior posterior or head to tail morphogen gradient, which helps break the symmetry of the embryo and start patterning it. And so what we know about bicoid is that there's tens of thousands of molecules of bicoid in the nuclei in the anterior of the embryo and tens to hundreds in the nuclei of the posterior of the embryo. And despite this massive change in concentration, it's regulating gene activity all along the concentration gradient. And the way people have classically described this as working is by regulating the affinity and number of bicoid binding sites. So it's, uh, sites that are only active at uh, high concentrations are very sensitive to bicoid concentrations. So as soon as the concentration drops, they shut off. And the ones that are low sensitive would be uh, expressed at a larger range of uh, concentrations. And at the molecular scale, what this evokes is this idea of cooperative binding. So you have two adjacent binding sites, and if two molecules are occupying these two adjacent sites, they stabilize one another, leading to low off rates and long residence times at that site. And the opposite is true at the low concentrations. So you have independent binding events leading to high off rates. So, you know, this is kind of a simplified model, but I wanted to go and test these very classical models of how bicoid is working inside of the embryo. So how do we look at these molecular scale events? So first, now with gene editing, we insert a sequence for a fluorescent protein into our, the gene of the protein that's encoding the protein we're trying to follow. So when that gets transcribed and translated, you have a fluorescent protein attached to your gene of interest, your protein of interest. Then if you just take a picture with a microscope, because of the diffraction limit of light, all these molecules get blurred together. You can't resolve individual molecules. So you get a picture of the average concentration of these proteins. But we want single molecule resolution. So what we do is use photoactivatable probes. And this is a now a very common idea uh, known as palm microscopy, where you stochastically turn on a few fluorophores at a time, uh, relying on conformational changes. And the stochastic activation level is so low that the probability of two molecules overlapping each, each other in a given frame of your movie is negligible. And then you can point to the center of these detections with extremely high precision, uh, around tens of nanometers, depending on the number of photons you collect. Now, this has been done in cells for a long, long time, more than 20 years now. But going into embryos is hard because essentially when you move deeper into samples, the conventional microscopy technologies, you begin to lose contrast because you have one objective for excitation and you're shining light through the whole sample, which basically degrades your contrast. So to overcome this barrier, I built what's called a lattice light sheet microscope, which is designed by Eric Petzig's group. And um, here we use interference effects between an array of what are called Bessel beams. We control the spacing and phase of these beams to uh, create a very, very thin light sheet, the thickness of which is matched exactly to the depth of field of a detection objective. So you don't excite anything you're not looking at. And this type of microscopy has a lot of advantages, but for now, what we care about is it allows us to do this, that we can now look at single molecules shown here in green as the viz around inside of a living embryo and find and bind the targets on chromatin, which is DNA packaged into the nucleus, by the way. Uh, this is marked by the histone H2B. Uh, and this is happening inside of a living embryo, the edge of which you're seeing here in red, which is autofluorescent. And we can do this indefinitely throughout the life of the embryo without affecting its viability or development. So these type of movies continue to blow my mind that we can look at single protein molecules inside of a living animal. But I think what's really cool or even cooler is what we can do with this data. So once we have these localizations or once we have these detections, we localize them with the nanometer precision and then we connect the localizations into trajectories. And we can then begin to ask questions like how do these molecules explore the environment? What are the thermodynamics of their binding to specific targets? And what are the search strategies that have evolved? So now armed with this technology, go back to the initial question that I posed, which is how does the binding event, uh, uh, the off rates of bicoid binding vary as a function of its concentration? So here we use long exposure times. So the fast moving molecules blur into the background and you only get diffraction limited point detections from molecules that are still for a significant period of your exposure time we track them and we accumulate the dwell times, how long the trajectories last into a survival probability distribution, which we can then fit here with a two uh, exponent model for non-specific and specific binding. And we uh, take into account effects like photo bleaching and probability of axial defocalization to then determine 
the specific off rates, which for Bitcoin turned out to be on the order of one to two seconds. Now, this is very fast, faster than what was imagined uh, by biologists for many decades, but it turns out many, many transcription factors actually bind DNA transiently. But for this, for the purpose of what I'm talking about here, these off rates actually do not vary as a function of Bitcoin concentration. So this looks the same no matter where you measure it in the embryo. So from a naive point of view, this is very nice. You know, uh, this was an idea posed a long time ago on how you would achieve concentration sensitivity. So yeah, if you have high on rates and high off rates at the interior of the embryo, if a molecule pops on and off very quickly, another molecule will reoccupy that site leading to high time average occupancy. Whereas at low concentrations at the same site, if a molecule pops on and then off, the probability of the site getting reoccupied in a reasonable amount of time would be very low, leading to a low time average occupancy. But this type of model predicts that you would have a very small amount of uh, fraction of the molecules bound at the posterior of the embryo. So I wanted to go and measure that. And so I'll just tell you how we do that measurement. So now we go as fast as possible. So we can see all uh, of our different kinetic populations. We measured the displacement between individual localizations in our trajectory. We accumulate those into a displacement probability uh, distribution. And then we can fit this to a Gaussian mixture model of uh, a slow and fast diffusion. So just classical diffusion. And we can back out fraction bound and diffusion coefficients while correcting for things like molecules uh, defocalizing and photo bleaching. And then from this analysis, essentially what we found was that the fraction bound doesn't change a lot as a function of concentration. In fact, you see a slight uptick at the posterior. Now, people with more a biological background in the audience might be thinking, okay, this is probably all non-specific transcription factor binding. So we decided to test for that using an assay called chromatin amino precipitation and sequencing, where essentially we cut off the posterior thirds of embryos and use sequencing uh, uh, to figure out where transcription factors are binding. And from that, we found that Bitcoin is actually able to occupy known target sites. And this poses a very interesting kinetic challenge. So how do you achieve specificity given the short interface times in the face of low on risk because of low concentrations and the high off risk that we had measured? And the answer came when we looked at the spatiotemporal distribution of binding events. And what we found was that binding, this is using pair correlation analysis, we found that the binding is clustered throughout the AP axis of the embryo. But this clustering is in, uh, more visible to the eye when you go to the posterior and you lose this large background of Bitcoin. And what this was, what was really remarkable about this was that the time average concentration of molecules in the posterior clusters were able to match the densities in the anterior of the uh, nuclei. And what this suggested to me was that evolution had somehow harnessed these very weak DNA binding interactions and then combined it with likely weak protein-protein interactions to come up with a way to tune mass action locally around individual genes and perhaps enable this binding. So this got us very focused on understanding what is enabling this tuning of mass action. Um, and from our genomics data and from the literature, we very quickly arrived on this other protein called Zelda. And to, to cut a sh long story short, we knocked Zelda out. And what we found is that the clustering, again, analyzed using pair correlation analysis, is abolished when we knock Zelda out all throughout the AP axis of the embryo. So this, of course, raises the question about how this other protein is not helping to form these clusters. So I'll tell you a little bit about Zelda to help understand this. So Zelda is actually an acronym for Zinc Finger Early Drosophila Activator. And it was originally known by a German named Will Faltig, which I'm told means diverse, and because it plays a huge number of roles in the early embryo. And one of these roles is to potentiate the binding of many, many of these transcription factors. And unlike Bitcoin, Zelda is distributed uniformly in the embryo. It doesn't form a gradient. Now, the last thing that I'll tell you that is important for the purpose of this talk is that it, it has a DNA binding domain that's comprised of four what are called zinc fingers, which help tell it where to go. And the rest of it is predicted to be intrinsically disordered. So intrinsically disordered means that the protein does not fold into a known secondary structure or is not predicted to fold into known secondary structure. Instead, it has a lot of conformational plasticity. And this kind of conformational plasticity is known to help enable multivalent protein-protein interactions, 
and and so the model we had in our head was then these zinc fingers help guide Zelda to a specific site on the genome. And now these floppy domains are interacting with Bitcoin and helping to lead to the clustering that we're observing. Unfortunately, when we measured the single molecule binding of Zelda, what we found was that its residence times are also very, very low on DNA on the order of five to six seconds compared to the two to three seconds we we're measuring for Bitcoin. So it wasn't stably associating with uh, the DNA leading to this kind of anchoring kind of model that we were uh, proposing. But instead, what we, when we looked with high dimensional, uh, so high speed 4D imaging, so here's the edge of the embryo and you're seeing the nuclei now. What we found is that Zelda's distribution in the nuclei is highly non-homogeneous. So what you see is as you exit mitosis, it quickly loads onto DNA and then it segregates into these clusters that we call hubs because they help seem to organize a transcription reaction as I'll show. Um, and this kind of imaging uh, reveals that it's not really discrete bodies, but kind of hotspots that emerge and melt on the order of tens of seconds. And to me, this really hammers home the point that the local proteomic environment that an individual gene can experience in the nucleus can vary very, very rapidly in space and time. Now, we wanted to understand what this kind of hub formation, how this relates to the clustering of Bitcoin. Is, it, is this where Bitcoin is binding? So then we image Zelda uh, along with specific binding events of Bitcoin. We parse the nucleus into high and low regions of Zelda concentration. And then we ask, is Bitcoin binding preferentially in these Zelda hubs? And what we found here is pretty remarkable that at high Bitcoin concentrations, there's a twofold enrichment of Bitcoin binding inside of Zelda high regions. And this goes up to fourfold in low Bitcoin concentrations. So Bitcoin is more dependent on Zelda at the lower concentrations, consistent with what we found from a genomics assay that Bitcoin needs Zelda to overcome this kinetic challenge of finding specific sites. So what we've shown, what I've shown you so far is that Bitcoin clusters, Bitcoin bind, clustering is enabled by binding in Zelda hubs. And of course, the big question is, what does this have to do with what we're ultimately interested in? How do you turn genes on and off? So here we did an assay, which I think is super cool. We insert this sequence from bacteriophages, so viruses that infect bacteria, into our gene of interest. This is a sequence called MS2. When it gets transcribed, the RNA forms a stable stem loop structure. This stem loop structure is recognized with super high affinities, picomolar affinities by this other viral code protein called MCP. And if you express MCP fused to a fluorescent protein in your embryo, it binds to this nascent RNA. So you have a beacon of where that gene is actually being transcribed in your microscopy data. And not only that, you have multiple copies of it. So you can actually look at the dynamics of the transcription reaction at the same time. So now we can get movies like this, where again, we're inside looking at the edge of the embryo. We see the distribution of Zelda, and now you'll see a gene called hunchback turn on, which is a canonical target of Bitcoin. So what you might immediately have noticed, what we at least immediately noticed, is that these Zelda hubs don't seem to form around this gene as we might have thought they were. Uh, but instead, what we notice is that they're kind of transiently interacting. Okay, this doesn't want to play. Uh, all right, this movie doesn't want to play. Uh, so what we noticed was that these hubs, if you were able to see the movie, are interacting transiently with uh, the locus of interest. And when we try to, okay, I'm just going to quickly stop the presentation so the movies play. Let's try this again. All right, there we go. Um, so what we see is that we can, if you look around that locus, hunchback locus, and ask if the protein distribution around it is changing uh, compared to random size in the nucleus, we can pick up an enrichment for Bitcoin. Now, this isn't really surprising, right? Or shouldn't be surprising. Transcription factors are known to bind genes uh, and should be enriched there. But what is surprising, uh, at least what we found new here, is that how these transcription factors get to the targets. So they get incorporated into these hubs. These hubs interact preferentially somehow and transiently with the gene of interest and then load these transcription factors on there. So what? let me just kind of summarize some of this, the main concepts here. So what we found was uh, that we should move away from thinking about the average nuclear concentrations of transcription factors. Because in fact, the local concentrations can be modulated and can thus directly modulate mass action locally ar around individual genes. 
Now, this idea has really come into the forefront of our thinking on uh, many regulatory mechanisms in, inside of cells recently because of the emergence of the concept of liquid-liquid phase separation in regulating gene expression and other cellular processes. But what I, what I really want to hammer home here is what we observe is that there's a range of dynamics and behaviors that we see that can lead to local protein accumulations from very transient clustering for transcription factors to more stable things that do look like perhaps droplets for proteins like HP1 and uh, the GAGA associated factor. But what's really interesting to me is maybe not the thermodynamics of what is leading to this clustering, but what are the molecular mechanisms of establishing these different domains inside of the nucleus, keeping them separate and establishing unique functional uh, compartmentalization in the nucleus because these things don't exist in isolation they all have to interact with one another how do you keep molecules out of say active gene regions versus repressed gene regions and this becomes really exciting when you think about what is actually happening over here that as you proceed through development more and more transcription factors are being turned on different uh, genes are being expressed in different parts of the embryo along with the underlying chromatin topology being established so what I'm really excited about uh, using imaging to understand is how do you achieve these distinct compartmentalization how, uh, and how does that shape the underlying substrate, which is the genomic material, to push cells into distinct fates so that you can pattern the embryos uh, and get them ready for independent uh, life. So uh, with that, I would like to end on time. I think I'm on time first by thanking our uh, some of the people who worked on this project, including my previous advisors, uh, Bob Tijan, Xavier Darzak, and collaborators, Mike Eisen, Mike Stadler, Nan Garcia, and many other people in their labs. Uh, as I mentioned, my own lab just got started, uh, and we are already establishing a nice uh, interdisciplinary team. So please check out our website uh, if you're interested in more, or feel free to reach out to me via email. And uh, while I take questions, I'll leave you with a movie uh, of the, the microscope I constructed at Berkeley. This was five years ago now, so this is ancient technology, uh, but we're constructing a new version of this uh, at, uh, at Penn and Chop now. So uh, thank you for your time and attention, and I'm happy to take any questions. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, let me click on this clap thing here for everybody. Um, so we have a couple of questions in the chat. Um, first is from um, Diego asking, what is the temporal resolution that you can get for SBT using light cheek microscopy? So uh, in theory, we can go to like a millisecond because we're using CMOS cameras for detection. So there's not a, there's not a hardware limitation. The limitation is on the photon budget as usual for a single molecule, right? So how many photons can we squeeze out of a fluorophore in a given exposure time? So for MEOS, uh, the uh, 3.2, which was the fluorescent protein I'm using here, we start to get into uh, pretty limited uh, localization positions below seven and a half millisecond exposure times, which is what I was using over here. But uh, using these bright new organic dyes that are being developed, uh, I can imagine going to faster frame rates. Our issue right now is delivering those dyes uh, inside the embryo. So we're trying to overcome that with a few strategies. <clears throat> okay, there's a, uh, a follow up question from, from me. Um, and this, you might have already answered this for the 4D images. Are, are... Sorry, Viley, you're cutting out a little bit. Okay, give me one second. Okay, can you hear me now? Okay, great. Thank you. Um, for the, the 40 images are, are fantastic. My question is a technical one, and perhaps you just answered it. Um, but is the limiting factor in the 4D capture also the, the light intensity, the photon starvation? Uh, so it, it, again, it depends on the protein you're looking at. And for 40, there's different challenges, right? Because we're not dealing with localization based resolution now. We're actually dealing with you know, the diffraction limit resolution of the microscope. So, and that's actually linked to the protein that you're trying to image. So if you're looking at a structure that's changing very quickly and you wanna do 3D imaging at a relatively slow rate, then that structure begins to get blurred out. So there's trade-offs in what features you're trying to examine. Uh, 
So uh, with the live stream, you can go super fast in 3D. Uh, in principle, you know, hundreds of frames a second uh, while scanning like a 50 micron volume. Uh, but it really uh, it depends again on what type of structure, what type of information you're trying to extract. So if you look, remember the Zelda movie that I showed, that's why I showed two different movies. One was a 3D movie where we were looking at these hubs forming through the cell cycle. And then I showed a smaller movie in the corner where I basically park the light sheet in a single frame. So then we can go at faster frame rates to appreciate what's happening at, at those temporal resolutions. So there's always these you know, trade-offs and depending on what types of kinetic populations you're trying to analyze. Luckily, we're, we're getting to a scenario where we're not really limited by the hardware anymore. And we're really limited by the fluorophores and the, how, how much light the embryo is willing to tolerate as well. Great, that's, that's a great situation to be in, in terms yep. of hardware. <laughs> Um, several more questions in the chat. One from Nancy um, Ford. Um, wonderful talk and work. How much of this local clustering do you think is controlled by chromatin structure and organization? And can you perturb the chromatin structure to see if this changes the hubs? Yeah, this is a fantastic question and one that I think about often. Uh, we're not really sure about what, where the hubs form. So this is part of what we're trying to understand at the moment. Uh, what, what are the, uh, the cues to form a certain type of hub in time and space? I do suspect they're seated on arrays of binding sites that exist at many regulatory enhancers in the early embryo. And we're trying to direct the, uh, uh, test that directly now through mutagenesis experiments. Uh, there are many other models in the literature that uh, try to link uh, chromatin structure and organization to these types of protein distributions, but they're generally in fixed embryos or fixed tissue. So it's not, it's first of all, not even clear how chromatin organization is fluctuating dynamically at the time scales that we're looking at. So that's really the first question, you know, how do enhancers and promoters find each other and what is chromatin organization in, in a living sample? And then perhaps we can better appreciate how these hubs are either acting on that to shape that or how they're being shaped by that. This is a, this is a critical question in the field. 